Hey, thanks for listening to Heartland Church. It's our prayer that you're blessed by this content as you seek to grow in your relationship with Jesus. However, we don't intend for this content to take the place of your weekly worship and community in a local church. So if you need help finding a gospel-centered church in your area, please contact us online at www.connectatheartland.com. You know, I, um, I said earlier that, uh, that, that my prayer is that we would experience the presence of the living God tonight, and, and that's actually what drives, that's what drives everything we do here at Heartland Church. We want to create environments where people are radically transformed by the gospel of grace, where people can see the holiness of God and their deep need for Him, and then turn back into him through repentance and faith. And we believe because the Bible says that that happens when we are in the presence of God. You know, 2 Corinthians 3.18 says that we, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. That's profound when when you think about it because much of what the church has become in our current culture is about trying to manufacture change through our own self-effort. Be better, do more. But the Bible says that change comes when we behold the glory of the Lord. Transformation comes when we stare into his character and into his nature, when we consider his grandeur, when we behold his majesty. When that happens, when we see him for who he is, something comes alive in the human heart because we were created by him to worship him. That's why we exist. And so my prayer is that we are able to behold the glory of the Lord together this evening. And the best way to do that, the best way to behold the glory of God the Father is to look intently at Jesus Christ, the Son. That's what Colossians 1 says. Colossians 1 says of Jesus, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. It says, for by him, all things, all things, including you and me, were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through Jesus and for Jesus. For in him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. We just sang about that. Put simply, the invisible God is made visible in Jesus Christ. The fullness of God's character and nature are found in Jesus. Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature, according to Hebrews 1.3. So let's glory in the Father tonight for a few moments by worshiping his Son. After all, isn't that the point of Christmas Isn't that the point of Christmas? Isn't that the point of life itself? The glory of God the Father through the exaltation of Jesus the Son. Without that, without seeing the glory and the holiness of God and our great need for salvation through Jesus Christ, we can have all the entertainment and all the nostalgia and all the holiday cheer in the world, but we will not have life because Jesus alone is life. Let's dig into the Word of God together. If you have a Bible, I'd invite you to turn to the book of John and chapter 1. John chapter 1. If you don't have a Bible, not to worry, we'll have the passage up on the screen for you to look at. Now before we read our text in John 1, let me set the scene for us just a bit. Interesting that Austin just painted the picture of going all the way back to Genesis, the kind of the whole story of redemption. One of the common themes that we see throughout Scripture is the contrast that exists between darkness and light. We see that theme from Genesis all the way to the book of Revelation. From the beginning, where in Genesis chapter 1, the very first chapter of the Bible, disorder was marked by darkness. And God, in bringing life and bringing order to his creation spoke light into existence. All the way to the very end, 
Where we're told in Revelation chapter 22, the very last chapter of the Bible, that those who have been redeemed by Jesus will dwell with him forever and will need no light of lamp or of sun because the Lord will be our light. Isn't that beautiful? We don't need a sun because God is present and he is our source of light. So from the very first chapter of the Bible to the very last chapter of the Bible, like bookends, and then all throughout, there's this theme of darkness and light. You heard Sandy read this just a few minutes ago, Isaiah 9, 2. The people who dwell in darkness have seen a great light. Matthew 4, 16, very similar words. Okay. The people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. John 1, 5, what we're going to read in our text in just a moment. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. 2 Corinthians 4, 6, for God who said, let light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 2, 9. We now proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Ephesians 5, 8, for at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk then as children of light. That's but a sampling of the dozens of verses that deal with this theme. And never is that theme more poignant than at Christmas because it's the entire point of Christmas. It's why we celebrate Where there was darkness and death, God has brought light and life. That's the message of Christmas. And it's the reason why I want to look at John chapter 1 together. Because this is one of the clearest explanations of how all of this is really about the person and work of Jesus Christ. So John chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, capital W was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He, it's talking about the Word, He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. (laughs) Family gathering. Sounds like my house. It's beautiful. All right. Verse 6, listen. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This is John the Baptist. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the Word, capital W, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. This is the word of God for us tonight. Let me pray, and then we're going to unpack this for just a few moments, all right? Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this word. Thank you for this reminder of the gospel tonight where we see the radiance and the beauty and the preeminence of Jesus. We ask, God, that you would write these words on our heart that we would be forever changed, that you would do a work and redeeming us tonight, God, and drawing us closer to yourself, God. So have your way with us, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. All right, now, everybody here probably knows that brevity is not my strong suit, but since the wheels on the bus are coming off, we're going we're, we're to make this quick, all right? But listen, we've got an opportunity here to look at 
one of the most beautiful texts in explaining the gospel to us. And so I want to point out for us four things about Jesus that we can derive from this text. Four things that we must believe if we're going to embrace the gospel and be reconciled to the Father, if we're going to be made right with God. And before, before I jump in and unpack that, let me qualify what I mean when I say we must believe. Because our tendency is to hear that and translate that agree with. As in, these are four things that we must agree with in order to be saved. But that's not at all what I mean. We talk about this often. The demons agree with the four things that I'm about to say about Jesus. Literally, the demons know exactly who Jesus is. They believe in him intellectually. They recognize him. But we're shooting for something a little higher than a demonic level of belief. You with me? We're talking about belief that drives us to action. We're talking about placing our trust in something, submitting our life to that thing. That's where cognitive belief becomes faith. It's kind of like the difference between looking at the chair that you're sitting in right now and saying, I think that chair will hold my weight, and actually placing your weight in that chair. You see, that's faith. So when I say that these are four things that we must believe, I mean that these are four things that we must place our faith in, our trust in. They move us to submit our lives to Jesus. That's the goal of all of this. It's simply that we would see the truth of who Jesus is and that we would run to him just as we are, knowing that he is the only source of life and joy and peace. And if you're like, Jeff, I already believe in that. I have faith in him like that. That's great. My hope is that you you would embrace him all the more, that your heart would well up with, with, with a sense of fresh affection for him, that you would treasure him all the more. So here they are, four things truths about Jesus that we must embrace if we're going to have life. I'm going to give them to you up front, and then we'll unpack them one by one. We're going gospel 101 tonight. Number one, Jesus Christ is God. Jesus Christ is God. Number two, Jesus Christ became a man. He became a man. Three, Jesus gave his life as a ransom for you and for me. He ransomed us. And finally, number four, Jesus Christ is light and life and the only way to salvation. You got that? Jesus is God. He became a man. He gave his life as a ransom for us. He's light and life, and he is the only way to salvation first. Jesus Christ is God. Throughout history, it's interesting, throughout history, people have tried to dismiss Jesus as simply a good teacher or uh, simply a, a, a good prophet or just a moral man, a really good guy. But there's a problem with every one of those options. Jesus claimed himself to be the eternal God. <laughs> That's a problem. This means that he can't simply be a good teacher or a great prophet or a moral man. He is either God and infinitely more than those things or he was a liar and he couldn't be any of those things. There's no middle ground, you see. We are told in this text that Jesus Christ is the Word. Verses 1 and 2, in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and we're told that everything was created through Jesus, this word. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. All of this is driving us to the fact that Jesus Christ is eternally God. That is the message of the Bible, and we can't deal with any other truth about Jesus until we embrace this foundational truth about Jesus. And I love the interaction that Jesus had with Peter in Matthew chapter 16. Jesus turned to his disciples and he asked them, hey, who do the people say that I am? And the disciples answered back. They said, well, you know, some say uh, you're John the Baptist. You've come back rather quickly, reattached your head. Uh, some say that you're perhaps Elijah come back or Jeremiah or some other prophet who's returned. And then Jesus looked at me and said, yeah, yeah, okay. But who do you say that I am? And it's Peter who answered him. And Peter said to him this, 
You are the Christ, which means Messiah. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. And I love how Jesus responds back to him. He said, it's not the flesh that revealed this to you, Peter. It's the father. We must believe that Jesus is God. But that's not all we must believe. We must also believe that Jesus Christ became a man. That's our second point. Jesus became a man. Look again at verse 14. Skip down. And the word, the same word that was with God and was God, the same word that is eternal, the same word through which everything was made, that same word became flesh and dwelt among us. We've seen his glory Glory is of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. It's not enough to believe that Jesus is God. We must believe that he's God incarnate, that he stepped out of heaven, that he took on the form of his own creation, that he invaded time and space, the light of God entering the darkness of this world. But why? Why is it so important that we believe that? It's important because if we don't believe that Jesus Christ is both God and man, then he's never able to uniquely accomplish this third thing, that Jesus gave his life as a ransom for us. Only God incarnate can do this. Only God incarnate can do this. Now, this is not explicitly written in the text, but because it's the central theme of the gospel and it's taught pervasively throughout the pages of scripture, I feel pretty confident including this point. Verses 12 and 13 explain the result of Jesus ransoming us. It says, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, listen to this language, he gave the right to become children of God who were born not of, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but born of the will of God. Friends, this is the point of the entire Bible. It's the, into, it's the point of the entire Bible. Mark 10, 45. The Son of Man, that's Jesus, came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Romans 5, 8, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, for our sake, he made him to be sin, Jesus, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. You and I separated separated from God by our sin, dead in our trespasses, in complete darkness and without hope, rescued by the righteous Son of God. You you and I, enemies of God, following the prince of the power of the air, as Ephesians 2 puts it, hating God, hating each other, feasting on sin, all of it paid for by the spotless Lamb of God. Do you believe that? Do you have faith in that? It's important that you do. There's no conversation more important that you will ever engage in your life because, and this is our last point, Jesus Christ is light and life and he is the only way by which we are saved. Verses four and five, in him was life. In him was life and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. I want you to think back to the verses that we discussed at the beginning. The people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Where darkness and death once reigned, God has invaded with light and life through Jesus Christ. Where we, were, where we were enslaved by sin and marked by separation from God, he sent his son to bring us salvation. I want you to think about this. I'm almost done. I want you to think about this. What is sin? At, at the very core, what is sin? M- maybe one, one of the best answers to that question is, sin is you and me trying to take God's place, right? 
It's us trying to take God's place. That's what ushered in darkness. We, we didn't create ourselves. We can't sustain ourselves. We have no control over anything that goes on in our lives. Not really. And yet in our pride, we try to be the Lord of our own lives. Now just think about how beautiful the gospel is. If sin is me trying to take God's place, then what is salvation but God taking our place? It's God taking my place, your place, by stepping out of heaven to live the life that you and I didn't live and to die the death that we deserve to die. If you don't hear anything else tonight, please hear this. You need Jesus Christ. You need Jesus. More than anything else in your life, you need Jesus. You need him like you need air. You need him like you need water, like you need food. You need him more and more with each passing minute. And so do I, because without him, we will not know God. We cannot know God the Father without Jesus the Son. Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 and 5 says this, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. Why? To redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption, sons and daughters. The only way, the only way to be reconciled to God the Father is through Jesus Christ the Son. It's by placing our faith and our trust in him. Hear that tonight, friends. That's the message of the gospel. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for who you are. This is all orchestrated, God. This all has been orchestrated by you. This is about you, God. So we thank you, God, for your love for us. It's your love for us, God, that has pursued us. It's your love, God, that you set upon your people before the foundation of the world, God. This is all your work. And we thank you for that, God. We pray that you would do a work in our hearts, God, to show us the truth, God. We pray that you would work to bring us near, to reconcile us, God. Would you have your way stir in us, God. Show us your glory. Show us what's true. And God, bring us to an end of ourselves. Bring us to an end of ourselves that we might see our great need for Jesus. We pray all of this in his name because it's powerful, it's mighty, it's beautiful, it's majestic. So we pray all of this in the powerful name of Jesus Christ.